I'll briefly introduce uh, the fourth member of the panel um, who didn't uh, give a talk, but she's going to participate in the discussion. Um, Michelle Meyer, raise your hand, Michelle. <laughs> Michelle Meyer, uh, PhD, JD, is a bioethicist and a legal scholar who studies, among other things, human subjects research, learning healthcare systems, privacy and data sharing, and science communication. Uh, and she's assistant professor and director of research ethics in the Center for Translational Bioethics and Healthcare Policy at Geisinger Health System in Pennsylvania. All right. So if anyone wants to contribute questions, make sure to give them to the people who are walking around. Um, and I guess what I'll do, by the way, just, uh, just so you don't think that I'm texting or you know, reading the news or something like that while I'm moderating, I have questions written on my phone. Um, so when you see me looking down at my phone, that's why. So I want to start with a question for Michelle. Um, and one thing I noticed is, uh, both in this panel and earlier in the rest of the conference, is there have been many ambitious research projects and data collection efforts and use of um, large data sets described here. Um, but three letters I didn't hear very much mentioned um, among all the acronyms and discussion were um, I, R, and B. Uh, there wasn't that much discussion that I saw, at least, about um, institutional review boards. And as a researcher myself, um, I worry that IRB members and ethicists um, too often seem to be making the perfect the enemy of the good. Um, and given how much researchers worry about dealing with their IRBs, and maybe the cost of this anxiety about dealing with people who review our research projects, um, such as maybe a lack of research creativity due to just a form of learned helplessness where we sort of, we don't want to just get rejected by the IRB and so on, so we don't even try to submit anything all that provocative. Um, uh, how should uh, researchers sort of trying to innovate with technology and psychiatry and help solve these pressing mental health problems, how should they approach this kind of work? Um, or maybe um, another way of putting it is what crap should they not take from their IRBs um, and how can they um, push back? Do you have any thoughts, Michelle? Um. So, well, well, since the focus of, of these two days is technology, I guess one thing I would say is that, you know, not, okay, first caveat is that if you've met one IRB, you've met one IRB, right? So almost nothing you can say about IRBs um, carries over to all of them, both because there's considerable amount of variation among IRBs and also because we unfortunately have very little empirical data about IRBs. Um, that said, the average IRB member or IRB panel as a collective is not usually well-trained in technology. They aren't technologists. They aren't experts in those things. And sometimes when you put forward a protocol that involves technology, um, there's something of a deer in headlights phenomenon where suddenly risks become uh, heightened, or they certainly can. They can appear to be heightened um, from the IRB's perspective. So um, there's actually a helpful article that was recently published. The lead author is Luke Galinas. I think it was published in AJOB, American Journal of Bioethics. Um, I'm sure a quick Google will bring it up. But the, the main piece of advice that those authors had, which I think is, is a good one, is to try to find a non-technological analog to, um, to what you want to do. So for example, if what you want to do is recruit through social media, recruit through some technology platform, um, you might liken that by analogy to putting a poster on a bus. Uh, and so it's some sort of you know, more old school type of recruitment or a type of intervention and, and try to get the IRB to, to think about it that way. Um, so there's, there's one tip. Um, what should you, what crap should you not take from the IRB? Um, if in general, if your IRB tells you to destroy your data, um, don't do that. Um, now I'll say there, there was, you know, there was a good exception. If you're capturing third party information, it has none of the study data you want and all of the, the privacy eroding data that you don't want, yes, destroy that. Um, but, but actual data that you want, think really carefully before you, you destroy that. We have a sort of history of consent forms that have boilerplate clauses that say, you know, data that, um, there, there's a great, so there's a, another conference, it's actually an annual conference it's happening right now, in fact, um, it's called Primer, it's sort of the IRB conference, and I was at it uh, several years ago, and, and someone put up the slide, and it was a snippet from an actual protocol, and it said, you know, the PI will personally smash the videotapes with a sledgehammer when, when the study is over. 
Um, and, and it was sort of you know, amusing and everything, but, but it's actually troubling because these, these types of data destruction clauses um, have been historically ubiquitous. And now that we're in this heady space of open science and data sharing and learning healthcare systems where we all want to combine data for lots of different reasons and learn from it, it's really hard to do that if you've destroyed the data. Um, so absent rare circumstances, I would say do not let the IRB, the, the common rule does not say that you have to do that. It says nothing about data destruction. Um, so that's one thing. Um, similarly with data sharing, um, again, the common, the common rule is, is basically silent about that. So um, don't, don't let your IRB tell you that data sharing is, is bad. Um, and don't let them tell you, no matter how sensitive the data is, don't let the IRB tell you, and don't you yourselves assume that your participants are necessarily opposed to sharing that data. Um, one way of trying to destigmatize um, a condition or data is to proactively share. Um, that's not for everybody. That won't be everyone's preferences. Um, a stone's throw away from here is George Church's lab, which is the home of the Personal Genome Project. I sit on the board of directors, and I'm also a client, and I'm, I'm also a participant, but this involves whole genome sequencing, publishing it on the internet for anyone with an internet connection to look at, and as much phenotype information as participants are willing to share. For some people, that includes Huntington's diagnoses or variants, it includes abortions, it includes sex abuse experience, it includes extremely sensitive um, data. And the point is, Harvard's IRB eventually found their way. They started with, um, a requirement that the participant had to have a, a master's degree in genomics or its equivalent. Um, that was sort of for the first 10 participants. That, that didn't last a whole long time, but they eventually, you know, the sky didn't fall. And the, really the whole purpose of the PGP is really a proof of concept. It was if people are, are share sensitive, traditionally stigmatized data, will the sky fall? What will happen? Um, and as the, the experiment went on and, and nothing generally did happen, the IRB was willing to reconsider, and now the, the framework is um, a, a informed consent quiz where you have to pass a certain, uh, with 100% success, you have to pass this quiz that, that explains, um, that demonstrates your knowledge uh, of some fairly, you know, moderately um, sophisticated level of, of genetics and genomics, uh, including all the privacy risks. Um, and, and all of that, and there are people who can't pass it, and so they aren't participants, but those who, who can do. And that, again, is not a, a panacea for all problems with informed consent, and it's not workable for every study. But the point is, um, the most highly sensitized, uh, sensitive data can be shared as openly as you can imagine, uh, and, and that is still a possibility. So with that as your sort of lodestar, you know, don't, don't too quickly think that data sharing is, is impossible. Um, well, uh, so uh, one more question before before we get to before we get to Lisa, I just wanted to follow up on that data sharing point just for a second. Um, so uh, I was actually kind of depressed by by Elisa's own slides uh, about <laughs> how much uh, you know these uh, participants or patients say that they don't want people to have access to their uh, to their data. I, I want to follow up with you about that about sure. that later. But but before then, um, uh, I mean, data share. There are many different kinds of data sharing. So what is data sharing really? Um, really mean. Um, not all data is alike. Um, even things that people call sensitive are not necessarily alike. And, and is, could it be that sort of the needs of our collective needs to solve the problems we've been talking about here um, uh, might in some sense outweigh some of the preferences of individuals um, in the system that we may be giving too much weight to autonomy and, uh, and, and consent to all kinds of data sharing and granular access to data and so on um, and gumming up the works a bit. I'm trying to be provocative here, but uh, Michelle, and then anybody else who wants to say something um, about that. Aren't we all in this together, and shouldn't we all be sort of just assumed to be contributing, uh, you know, our part? Yeah, so um, U.S. bioethics is not exclusively, but, but to some extent to blame for this. There is a, a fetishization of individual autonomy, individual interests, and informed consent. And I think not for not for any learning activity, um, but for those that are uh, low to no risk, I think we should be thinking less about individual preferences and more about things like solidarity, more about justice in distribution of risks and benefits. Um, 
and, and avoiding free riders, frankly. And when we think about informed consent, you know, we should think more broadly. So there's the, the stereotypical study-specific formalized informed consent that usually involves a piece of paper and a signature. There is verbal consent, which can be a little more flexible. Um, there is uh, notice and an opportunity for opt-out. And then there's just notice, where your opt-out might be you get your care at a different organization. So one analogy um, might be teaching hospitals. Different teaching hospitals have different policies here, but certainly some of them have a sort of notice when you walk in the door. It says, this is a teaching hospital. One consequence of that is that your body and your data are going to be seen by more individuals than they would if you were receiving your care at a, at a private clinic or other organization. And I can imagine, um, as institutions move towards learning healthcare systems, and I would say, you know, Geisinger is, is an aspiring learning healthcare system, sounds like Harvard is too, that's great. No institution is truly a full learning healthcare system today in the uh, IOM or now National Academy of Medicine model. But as we move towards that, I could imagine a, um, a, a universe, I think it's a universe in which I would like to live in personally, but maybe I'm weird, where at least um, de-identified, de non-identifiable data is analyzed, and, and not just, we've talked mostly today about um, data analysis, big data, machine learning, et cetera, but yesterday we heard, and we should, we should remember the other tool in the Learning Healthcare System Toolkit, which is, of course, RCTs, or A-B testing, if you prefer. Um, there are certainly pragmatic trials, um, ROMP, research on medical practice, so there are, are, are other methods of studying and improving medical practice that I think uh, should, should potentially be done with notice, and, which means transparency, and it probably also is going to mean education, um, because as we heard yesterday, um, medicine in general depends on trust, mental health care in particular depends on trust. And so it won't be enough, probably, to literally just post a notice saying, this is a learning healthcare system and this is what we're doing. If you don't like it, go across the street. There will need to be engagement with the population um, and, and we'll need to figure out how do we communicate because the word research is sort of the R word. Um, I mean, heaven forbid you use the E word experiment. Um, you're really going to be in trouble. So I mean, I'm serious about that. There's empirical data that suggests if you talk about study, that gets one reaction. If you, if you use the same activity and you refer to it as research or experiment, um, people rate the same activity as riskier, et cetera. So we have a lot of work to do in thinking about how to break out of this traditional model of, of opt-in, study-specific informed consent, and to think about how to communicate what a learning healthcare system is and why it's important and why, yes, we are all in it together. All right, thanks. So I saw Lisa wanted to get in there. I, 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 I'm depressed by your patient preference data, but I, I wonder why we should take it seriously. You can ask people what they want, and they can tell you lots of things, like I want ice cream every day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but we shouldn't take that seriously. Um, so what should we really do with your patient preference data, and what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so thanks. So question. I, I've thought about this a lot, and I want to also give this more background. My area of research that I've done, you know, worked for years is using insurance claims data to look at measuring and, and how, you know, measuring uh, behavioral health quality and systems of care. And so I've worked with, you know, de-identified, like, you know, different kind of big data. Um, and um, and I, I guess I would say that a couple of things. One is, I agree, we have to engage patients at the clinical level and we have to engage them at the research level to bring them along with us as to why it's really important to share information. I think I'm perhaps less comfortable, perhaps, than others around the, you know what, like we're all in this together whether you like it or not. <laughs> I, think the, I think really the first goal of, of a healthcare system is to be able to provide patients the care that they need. And not all patients are going to be comfortable with how their health information is shared or, you know, for clinical or research purposes. Um, I, I think from a clinical perspective, you know, and I, I've also been troubled looking at how patients would share information from a clinical perspective. The way I look at it is, you know, uh, again, there's informed consent, right? Like, uh, if you explain to a patient, I, I think that patients really should own their data. If you explain to a patient, this is why it's really important, um, of why we should share your information, at the end of the day, if they say I'm not really comfortable with that, then I, as a clinician, I have to make the decision, well, how comfortable am I with that? I'm not comfortable with that answer if it's a patient with an addiction and, and say their PCP is prescribing a controlled substance and I think that's dangerous for a patient. 
You know, so I, there's like clinical parameters of when we're comfortable with this and when we're not comfortable. And sometimes we say to patients, well, I'll have to, I don't necessarily agree with you, but I can, we'll work on this together and I'll still continue, you know, like I, I will respect what you say, you know, and there's laws around it too. So I, I guess I'm, I'm more comfortable with the approach of let's work really hard and robustly engaging patients and understanding the importance of a learning healthcare system and how we use their data, but that ultimately it's up to them. There are some public health concerns and population health management needs that, you know, I mean, we all realize that there's, there's um, you know, there are some times where, where uh, there are circumstances where we say, I'm sorry, it's not up to you, to patients, but I don't feel I guess I feel like that needs to be a robust conversation that includes patients in the dialogue about where we draw the, that line uh, personally. Um, and I, I also will just say on a personal level that a book that really influenced me on my thinking about this was The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Um, and it really, really made me rethink a lot about what is our social contract with our, our patient subjects, you know, in all of this. And, um, and really made me rethink a little bit about the, the power balance and what we as researchers gain from the use of, of these tissues and or whatever, you know, health information that um, the patients give to us. So anyway, those are just some of my thoughts on that. I think we need to educate patients more about all of this, but ultimately, uh, for the most part, I think it should be up to them, and we need to do a better job of bringing them in in the conversation. So, um, so following up on that, I've, I've heard several times here, and maybe this is gonna be a heretical question, but um, that patients should, sorry, patients should own their data, or they do own their data, um, why? Uh, you know, so data information about me, why, do, why is that owned by me? I mean, I don't think that's a legal fact. You know, why should it be the case that information is owned by me? What's the, what's the positive argument for that? I suppose aside from that, if that were the case, maybe patients would, uh, you know, put more trust in the system or something like that. But is, is it necessarily, does, does the positive outweigh the negative from patients owning their data and why should they own it? Does anybody have thoughts about that, especially uh, Kristen and Teresa? Well, I think that in the case that I presented, it's more complicated because the data contains information that's not just their data, but that's other people's data. Um, so I think that initially researchers were tempted um, to give the images to people at the end of the study as sort of an incentive because people were interested in sort of mementos of their life. Um, and then as thinking evolved, they realized, well, actually that's sort of violating other people's um, and the confidentiality of their information. Um, but I do think it's possible um, to give people data in a way that doesn't violate other people's privacy, even in this context, um, in a way that might be interesting to the individual. So you could give them some sort of summary data. Um, and that, I mean, there is evidence that uh, individuals who find out something about themselves through the study are more likely to want to do it. Um, but I do think you have to be careful in the setting I'm in where um, it's not just their data. And I'll just add to that, that um, as a consumer advocacy organization, we take, we, we believe and really see value in inviting people to be the center of research. So. When we think about whether people should own data, sometimes like Henrietta Lacks, it comes to like, well, did somebody profit from that research? And was that profit passed on or shared or in any way considered, you know, who that came from? Um, as, an, as a consumer advocacy organization, sometimes consumers, um, people, patients, feel like we're not included in the process. Um, we think that by including people in your design, um, in that process, that you're going to have a better outcome. You're going to find tools that are more likely usable um, and hopefully find outcomes that matter and maybe cut out a lot of gray. And so in that sense, how are we invited alongside researchers and equal participants and therefore it's not just my data, it's a collect, it, it would feel more like the collective data then that we're invited in that process than when we just give stuff and then, and then we let it go. Um, any other, uh, Elisa or Michelle wanna say anything yeah. about this question about owning data and then we'll go to a couple more. Yeah, I think you're right. I don't think it's a legal kind of thing, but you know, certainly patients have the right to say how their information is shared for treatment payment operations, you know, the HIPAA standard, um, then there could be freely passed information, but 
that's not, you know, research isn't in there, you know, in HIPAA. So I, I think that, um, you know, when we say that patients own their data, I mean, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that they physically own it, right? But uh, it's interesting, there was a study, one of the studies I cited about sensitive health information and how patients with that would share it with their PCPs, that the same set of patients, their doctors would ask, were asked a variety of questions, like how would you, you know, Variety of questions about sharing health information. And interestingly, a similar proportion of providers, about 43%, said they thought that pe patients should have, should be able to share, have some control over how their information is shared, which was about the proportion of patients with sensitive health information that wanted some control. So I think that it, it, it would be wrong of us to just say, well, patients just don't understand, you know, um, because even people who are, who are savvy to the healthcare environment have some, some similar concerns. Um, so, that's how I would view it. I, I guess I'm, since Henrietta Lacks has come up, um, <laughs> I, can't, I can't let it go, but I'm just, I'm curious. I mean, do people on the panel really think that people should be paid if, you know, ev literally every single person in this room has contributed, not, you know, wittingly or not, some sort of biospecimen to research? That's just the way it is, right? It's de-identified. In her case, it was de-identified because that wasn't a thing at the time. Um, and that did cause all kinds of privacy problems, but the general paradigm of if you, if we're taking bits and pieces of you for clinical purposes and you consent to the clinical procedure, um, as is your right, we have two choices. We can literally put it in the biohazard trash can or we can, we can strip it of identifiers and use it in research. Um, that, may, that continues to be what happens today. It, nothing was unique about her. Um, except she probably had HPV that probably created the immortal cell line, but she wasn't treated any differently than any of us are, are treated, except when people went back and tried to figure out who she was and they, you know, identified the line as HeLa, which was not de-identified, and then all sorts of bad things happened and then um, with, her, with her descendants. But the basic paradigm, um, no, no one got paid um, from the original sort of pro-band, but I've never seen a consent, I've never heard of a consent for, for a biobank or a biospecimen that says, yes, if this results in any sort of profitable innovation, we will send you know, some portion of the profits back to you. It's just not, um, the common rule now requires that you be told that that's not going to happen, but that's always what it says. Um, so I'm just curious, I mean, do people really think that we should be, there should be profit sharing for sort of passive, um, you know, leftover clinical specimens? So I, I'm personally not advocating at all. I, not, I wasn't even thinking about money. You know, I was thinking about the use of health inf my health information or someone else's health information and that it's really about informed consent. This is how we use your health information. And it's not, and, and it's, it, we've heard transparency, you know, in other talks, and that's really how I view it. I, if you hear Eric Dishman talk about all of us, it's really refreshing because he basically says, you know what? We don't really know all the answers to all this. Pro you know, like we're take, you know, for po folks who are willing to join us in this journey, you know, there's going to be a lot of thorny issues that we don't even really have the answers to. But we're going to work to be really open and transparent, and um, and we hope that you'll join us because it's for the better good. And I think that's a great approach. And I, I would just really, it's really more like I would like to see as institutions, I'd like to, as to see us more robustly educating our patients about this. And it's not about you know bringing them financially along at all. Well, I agree with that. I would just make two points that educate transparency, I think, is, is very important. And we have not, most people are surprised. Most people think that Henrietta Lacks was a unique case, and I think that's a problem, right? Um, the fact that everyone in this room has had a biospecimen used in research, um, stripped of identifiers and used, and, and most people in the U.S. don't realize that, I think is, is bad, because then it does come back to hunt you. So I absolutely agree there should be much more transparency about what's going on. I'm not convinced that consent under those contexts, at most I would say, you know, opt out. If you have very strong yep. views about de-identified use of your data, fine, but I don't really think op opting in. I mean, just the other thing with respect to all of us is just that that's a very different study where that, that's quite burdensome on participants. I mean, they're going to be doing lots of surveys, lots of measurements. I mean, that, I mean you have, that has to be yep. consent-oriented and it has to be um, a very different paradigm. Yep. 